Welcome to the Working CEO Podcast, where we share real advice for busy business leaders. No business school BS, no sugarcoating, just straight talk about how to get work done. Sometimes life and business seem to come full circle. That's the case for our next guest, Dave Gilbert. Dave started his career a preacher and two decades later is chief evangelist for the Cloud Communications Alliance. In between then and now, Dave, an avid surfer, rode the VoIP wave as the big cheese at his own cloud communications company, which later sold to Vonage. On this episode of The Working CEO, we will catch up with Dave, tech investor, consultant, publisher, and cloud evangelist. Stay tuned. It is so good to be back in studio, also known as my office, recording yet another episode with another fantastic guest. I'm Susanna Song, and with me always is the working CEO, Mark Porter. Hi, Mark. How are you? I'm great, Susanna. How are you? Good. Uh, I know we were talking a little earlier, and I was chuckling yesterday because when I jumped on a call, you also uh, were on that call, but you were walking around Manhattan. <laughs> so you are truly a working CEO, always up to something, hustling. I, I think I was walking around Manhattan in, in dire search of uh, relief. <laughs> that's I recall. true. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, was, uh, nah, one of the joys of the modern area where no uh, no restaurant wants to let you use their re- their restroom, even if you pay for something. So that's <laughs> awesome. And too much co- too much coffee from the uh, three a.m. wake up call and, and six a.m. flight. Well, today we've got so, a guest, Mark. So uh, we got. Dave Gilbert joining us. Dave, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, yeah, I mean, I I think we're talking about being an entrepreneur, and that's sort of been my journey for most of my life. Looks like quite an interesting journey with your background in theology and in your formal education. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how that journey kind of unfolded? Yeah, so I went to seminary. few years after seminary, I started a church with a few other guys, and then that took off. That was really fun. But that was my first experience of entrepreneurial church. Hmm. And uh, next thing you know, we were filling up a high school gym, and then from there, we went through a building program, and everything got a lot more complicated. But it was there that I, I decided that I would take a guy up on a dare when he said, you know what, you're, you're trying to teach guys these great truths, but you've never experienced what I've experienced in the workplace. Mm. And so I think you should quit this and let me give you a job so that, you know, you might be able to influence other people having some understanding what it's like to be a real guy. And, uh, and I said, you know, that seems crazy. I, this is a job what I'm doing. He said, no, it's not. You're inside of a bubble. It's not like, you know, you're, you're living with the pressures that we have to live. With. So what do you think about that? And I said, well, I don't know. You know, so I thought about it for about three or four months and went to my wife and said, hey, I, I think I might want to do like a lab experience and go out and learn what it's all, what it's really all about. And she said, what? No, you know, that's not your calling. And I said, yeah, I think maybe it is. And so that was my first step out. I went, in, went ahead and just sort of tried it, ended up loving it. And, uh, and still to this day, that's what I'm doing is um, not pastoring, but super involved in our church. That's for sure. So the thesis was essentially that you would be better able to serve people if you understood their day to day pressures of having a real job, being a sort of working stiff guy and, and yeah. going out and, and knowing what it's like to have to pay your bills and have to please your boss and all that. That was kind of yeah. what he was pushing you into. Yeah, that was about a four year run. But then I decided that th- there was an opportunity here for me to go and start another business. And uh, then that was crazy. That was the beginning of Simple Signal which was a voice over IP company. And we started when very few people had an idea of what could be. 
And so with that vision, I just started to look for people who knew something about it. So I got into a, a trade Did show. you know anything about it? No. I, no. Well, <laughs> hey, I'll step back. One of my customers was Cisco Systems. Okay. And uh, Y2K had finished its run. And so that was really putting my business at risk. What do we do next? What do we, and so I asked the guy, what, what's next? What does Cisco think is next? And he goes, oh, you won't believe this. We're going to put voice over the internet. That's going to be so cool and disruptive. And I thought, oh, this is really neat. This is going to be something I can jump into and be at the very beginning of this technology. So I didn't realize how difficult that was going to be. So I went to a friend of mine who happened to have exited uh, level three with $240 million. And so I figured that's where my money is going to come from. I'm going to get this guy to invest in this. And uh, he quickly said, you don't know what you're doing. You know, <laughs> I'm going to invest in this. So I had to put the first million dollars together and beg, borrow, and steal from anybody I could talk to about <laughs> this. And that was, we burned through that so fast. We were, <laughs> it was just crazy we, what we had to do, what we had to buy, and how much everything costs. So now I'm about a year into it. I got everything I own on the line, and uh, we didn't know if we really even had a product yet. So that was terrifying. But I found some really great people along the way. One of those guys was Michael Sturl, who you guys have done this podcast with. Yep. yep. And uh, if it wasn't for Michael, man, I'm telling you, we'd have been sunk a long time ago. But the uh, the synergy was good between us. And we did that, that one plus one equals 11, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, it was it was pretty cool. It was a, a, a great 12-year run. Actually. It was an interesting time, you know, people probably, you know, there's probably a lot of people out out here who didn't really, uh, watching this, who probably don't recall that time, they may not have been in the workforce or whatever, a little younger than some of us, but I, I, I when I relate that time to some of the younger guys and, and gals around, I tell them, you know, if you think about what happened in Y2K, I was selling phone systems back then. That was before Highwire. We were we were upgrading every one of our customers, and we had disrupted a hundred years of predictable cycles of communications. And and um, I was selling Lucent phone systems back at the time. There's another blast from the past name, and uh, we were at like three hundred percent of quota because our entire territories were all doing something, and it turned out they didn't need it. Um, and arguably it turns out that we might have known that somewhere along the way that it was going to be okay, but nobody bothered to say anything till it was too late. Um, so we forced all these upgrades on them. And then immediately after that was over and everything was fine and there was no Armageddon, we told them, oh, there's this disruptive technology. Now you're going to have to upgrade this stuff we just sold you because it's all going to be this voice over IP thing that, might or might not actually work. So that was uh, mostly not for a while there. And uh, I always credit um, the acceptance of voice over IP to uh, the cell phone, to be honest. I, I, if cell phones weren't so crappy and bad uh, with their coverage, people never would have accepted the quality that we foisted on them in the early days of voice over IP. I mean, who could have imagined in 1999, could you imagine an enterprise customer being okay with calls just dropping in the, in the middle of the conversation or yeah. not being able to hear it or jitter or any of the things that would happen. But by 2005, customers were perfectly content with the fact that it worked most of the time. So it was, a, it was an amazing... My customers were not content when that happened. <laughs> That's what we call outages. Yeah, and those were uh, terrifying. And, uh, well, when you, when you think about it in, in that voice business, it, it, they used to talk about it. You know, when when networks went down, people got angry. When the phone system went down, people lost their jobs. I mean, it wasn't 99.999 was the minimum standard. It wasn't like, you know, the maximum. It was It had to run, but we... 
as they went through that transition, the acceptance of glitching and calls dropping and all that stuff. In the early days, people got pretty upset about it, but now I think it's commonplace and people just accept that it's part and parcel of the experience. It's amazing. But it was so hard to convince somebody to put their business at risk. Yeah. Uh, When we were in and out and things didn't always work, like you said, and quality was not so good. It depended on their bandwidth and they were trying to put us over DSL and stuff like that. (laughs) So, you know, it was just a wild time, but look what we did. Yeah. I mean, we changed the world in, in so many ways. So, but is it, it is amazing. I mean, this, this podcast is being done on a hosted platform yeah. that wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for all of the things and all those advances. I mean, when you, when you look at it, it is amazing. I, I do tell people, and we own, uh, we own an interconnect carrier and a wholesale carrier. And I tell people, if you, for the lay person, um, in, in fact, I actually was having a conversation with my <laughs> with my father last night, and while I was having the conversation with him, he was getting robocalls, and uh, I explained to him what he needed to do, and he promptly, you know, reminded me that I know nothing. I said I do actually own a phone company, and so yeah. you know, <laughs> I know a little bit about how this all works. But it is amazing when you think about all the transitions and translations and and different touch points that a simple phone call makes. It's amazing that it, that any of them ever connect when it's all said and done. It's, it's mind blowing uh, if the lay person understood how it all works, that, that it ever gets connected. Right. Yeah. So, so you, uh, so you, you started up, you were voice over IP. You, you had this, uh, uh, you still, you stayed involved with the church along the way, I assume. Yep. Yep. And, and, then, uh, and where does this nickname, the big cheese come from? Yeah. So there's lots of CEOs, right? Whenever I was going to a trade show or any kind of an event that was related to our business, I'm walking in as the CEO, but I wanted to stand out. I wanted okay. it to be a little different in, of course. and not just become you know, <laughs> that label. And so I had, in years past been talked about as, oh, that's the big cheese. So that's what I took on. And so when I walked into the room, people would say, oh, that's the big cheese and just sort of play, you know, around with that. Would you dress the part? It was fun. I mean, did you dress the part? (laughs) No, no. (laughs) No, but it it opened up doors because Mm -hmm. people would want to talk to me. Or they would go and tell somebody else, hey, I just talked to the big cheese. And who's that? <laughs> so it was just a fun handle to have. And uh, and I just sort of went with it for all those years. You're like a marketing genius. Yeah. The yeah, personal yeah. brand. I like it. So how how would you compare it? It's, it's interesting. It's some, actually, some interesting parallels, I think, uh, kind of um, – I had some deep philosophical conversations with uh, with my mentor about this years ago and different things. And, and uh, you know, I say sometimes, actually my brother-in-law said it to me one time, sometimes, sometimes it takes, I said, it, sometimes it takes you a long time to find your mission. And, and my brother-in-law said, or, or your mission finds you. And, right. uh, and in a lot of ways, I kind of feel like that's been my journey is really the, you know, there's a lot of great things that happen from, running a business and it gives you a lot of opportunities we have over 300 employees and, and growing it gives you a lot of opportunities to impact people's lives in a lot of ways and hopefully positive right i mean it's a it's yeah. a weighty responsibility at times but um how how would you equate running a company to building a church and and you know what you know what, what are some of the things that that you see that uh, ultimately were kind of similar or prepared you for it with your journey yeah, you know, I, building a team was really important in both of those both of those kinds of enterprises. So I think that the culture was something that we really paid attention to. We cared a lot about our people. And we didn't just give them a job, we gave them a lifestyle. And we continued that for all of the years, from the very first employees onward, we... Uh, we really did 
I don't know what what really all these thoughts are coming through my head because I can just <laughs> see those faces. Yeah. Uh, but we had lots of things that ranged from I was telling Susanna about this scene where I was in California and our knock was in Denver. And I had some engineers that really didn't get along very well. And in the middle of us trying to uh, fix some of the stuff that was going wrong, they got super heated at each other. And I get this phone call from Michael and he said, Dave, you know, these Tim and John are fighting again. And I said, what? You know, just tell them to cool it. Just, they gotta work together. And so he said, no, Dave, I'm looking out my window. They're in the parking lot and they're hitting each other. <laughs> so I jumped on a plane, flew out there, fired one of them. You know, it was just, it was a disaster. But this was the, the thing that I'm saying about culture. What held us together is that most of the time it didn't heat like that. Instead, okay. it really was a chance for us to care about that other person, try to figure out where the, the difficulty was. And so when we needed people, we would go to our people because our people know good people, right? Mm. So they would recruit them. And the reason why they would come is not for the money because we weren't paying what other companies were paying at the time, but we got really good people because our people recruited them. And so that also preserved our culture after we got rid of some of the crazies, because you got to go through that, that freak stage where you have to hire freaks because you can't pay enough to get really good people. Right? <laughs> and so, so I've uh, never quite heard it. I've, I've never quite heard that. I like that. Though. Yeah. So we were having really some D players that were definitely freaks like those guys. That I just talked about. <laughs> so, um, but I, I think that it's, it was really important to build a company that had people that cared about each other. Mm -hmm. And we made that a priority in everything we did. And we you know, that, that is a, that's an interesting thing, especially in tech. Yeah. I think when you look across the technology sector, and I see it probably more heavily in our cybersecurity business where you have people who are deeply technical and very engrossed in what they do. Um, I'm not going to say freaky, but quirky individuals is almost the norm, right? And, and oftentimes individuals who are very rugged individualistic characters um, or, 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 and you know, maybe didn't grow up playing team sports or, or those sorts of those sorts of things. These are people who migrated to this individual role where I can analyze things to death or I can build something cool or whatever. Getting them to work holistically in a team uh, atmosphere is very challenging. And one of the one of the best ways I've seen is, is as you mentioned, I mean, we, we have, I think, the good fortune or you know, I often refer to it as a little lucky, but, um, you know, friends remind me that things don't always happen by chance that way, that there's, there's something to making your own luck in those, those ways. And I think it's culture. So these people bring others, it gets challenging at times to scale and really challenging when you need it at scale, where you start bringing in those outside influences, because uh, amazing to me, and I think every entrepreneur would benefit from understanding this. When you're looking at, no matter how big the business gets, when you're looking at making personnel changes or making leadership changes in a team, you always have to look at how far does that, that ball of string unravel if you start making those changes that impact your culture or impact those interpersonal ties, you know, who, whom goes with who and all those things, or Susanna can correct me, she's way better at grammar than I am. Mm -hmm. Um, so th those are really critical decisions that you have to make in getting to scale and getting things to work in a fashion that doesn't leave your employees beating the hell out of each other in the parking lot. <laughs> so, right. That's right. <laughs> although what the hell they got it out, right? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> at, at least they took it outside. They were gentlemen about it. 
So yeah, that's right. Yeah, that is crazy. Well, and that, that is a uh, that's a challenge too when you get into the 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 pressure cooker, right? That comes with something's not working or customers are unhappy. Um, that's that's one of, I think one of the unique challenges as a as an employer. It's one of the unique challenges that you have is when things are not going right. How do you help? diffuse a situation even if you know that person isn't going to maybe make it to the other side so to speak but how do you get them through the immediate situation in a serviceable fashion without disruption to your customers those are sort of uh hard-fought lessons over the years that that entrepreneurs have to figure out especially with small teams that's critical yeah and i think working with people you like is also going to make sticky employees. Mm. True. And I, I think that that is, is important. And then it's also that part of the culture was to just get stuff done. GSD, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, and that's what we instilled in our people is that you want to find the people you want to be with and then knock it out take the list and knock each thing down and when that happens you can show somebody the list and say look look what we got done and i think that that's important to do every day i think it's important to measure it along the way and to memorialize major gains so that's the stuff that that we did we had this thing called the stand-up meeting which every day we would gather the entire team. And at some point we had people in four different states, but we would start at, uh, it was nine o'clock central. And even if they were remote, you had to get in like we're doing right now, virtually. And every, all the work stopped from 9 a.m. to about 9.10. It was no more than 10 minutes. And we just talked about Roses and thorns. So roses were the great things that happened yesterday. And the thorns were the mistakes we made, the customers that were angry, and those kind of things that we would address just for a moment. And then ready, break. And then boom, everybody's back to work. But that that little gathering that reminded me of homeroom in high school, <laughs> Where, where people would say, oh, hey, yeah, it's Suzanne's birthday today, you know, that kind of thing. We would all, all of that kind of joy of sharing our failures and sharing our wins was just such a, a, a an amazing event every single day. Mm. And we got better because of it. We measured our progress and, uh, and we did it out loud and we did it for each other. That's uh, Walmart does something similar to this day. They've done it for, since almost the beginning where at the beginning of every shift, uh, the store manager gathers everybody up and they do a quick huddle. And, and that um, I think that's really important and hard to do, uh, it, you know, especially as, as an organization gets bigger, it's hard to keep that together. We, we have a system we use and I talk about it in almost every podcast because I, I think it's important no matter what that mechanism is that you just mentioned whether it's your stand-up meeting in our case we have our eos meeting everybody has at least one in our case it's once a week it's a very specific format you roll through it and it cuts the procrastination cycle down from you know monthly or quarterly which is common to weekly right Uh, you just don't have lag because lag kills businesses but uh, having that system or some sort of mechanism to keep people tied together keep them aware of what's going on and to help them, especially when you're innovating daily, that's a big deal. And yeah. you know, when it's about customer service and, and customer sat and how you share those lessons. Um, and I, I, you know, I had a call this morning where I said this and, and I think my team hears it a fair bit. I don't care what happened. I care why it happened. I want to understand. I, I don't know. I don't really care who's at fault, right? Like, what happened? Why was there an issue? And how do we correct it? Like this is just an opportunity to identify a flaw in the process. The process, every process is flawed because we only had so much information up until yesterday. And then we gathered more information yesterday. 
how do we incorporate that into what we're doing today? And if we have to change this thing every week, then so be it. Let's do it until it gets to a place where we don't have an issue every week, right? That's the right. that's the evolution of change. And change is happening very, very fast, probably faster now over the last two years than I've ever seen. And it's not just technology, it's right. culture, society, everything's going on. People are under a lot of stress. Yeah, so in our break room, we put our core values up on the wall. And um, one of our core values was this thing called Kaizen. It's a Japanese word, but what it means is incremental improvement over a long period of time. So that's what we were after in that stand-up meeting, was to be able to see our improvement, really. Sure, there's the negatives, the mistakes, but those are all accretive, you know, and it just has been such an important value that we put it up on the wall so everybody could see and know what that meant. So, Absolutely. so two questions for you. One, uh, how does surfing fit into the equation? Are you, <laughs> is this, uh, how many times a week do you get out to surf? Yeah, so a little less these days. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I still love the water. I'm still in it. Uh, I still live next to the water. And um, that's, that makes me get in it. And so that, <laughs> that's been fun. Uh, when I was a kid, I surfed every day. Yeah. And as I grew older and got more involved in other pursuits, I started maybe getting in the water once a week. And now I probably get in the water a little. Uh, I'm probably in the water once or twice a month. There's so, definitely something to uh, to uh, uh, my sort of my uh, my go to sort of uh, visualization is my happy place down down and there's a specific spot in the Gulf off of Key West. I get uh, a home down there and. and uh, uh, COVID disrupted my sort of every once a quarter escape down there and get yeah. detached, and get on the water. But there's definitely something to being out there and just uh, the smell, the wind, the sun, all of those things. Uh, it's a unique sort of feeling if you're kind of into that. I, I I don't I don't find anything else that restores my faith in humanity and my soul. And, Bring my mind at ease the way being on the water does. I I prefer it in a boat fishing for tarpon, ideally, but uh, nonetheless, on the water, just all of that is just uh, it's something special, man. Yeah, it is for sure. It does have that calming sense, doesn't it? I mean, there's a there's an interesting book called Blue, and it talks about the reason why humans like to be next to water. Whether that's a lake or an ocean, some sort of body of water becomes important to us because we're 80% water. And that's what draws us to being around it. And uh, I just thought that was really interesting. So it's definitely, I, be, I definitely view it as a life force. I never really made that connection, but it's something, there's something about it that, uh, you know, I could sit there and stare at it for hours. And I love the, the motion of, of a boat and just that kind of uh, that sense of ease is, is crazy. I think plus being, being uh, sort of at one with it to me is really sort of brings you back to uh, when you look at the amazing power, it makes you realize how relatively insignificant we are in the grand scheme of things to make yeah. the power of the tides and all mm -hmm. the things that go on on the ocean. When you get in the ocean and you're, you know, I like the fish for lobsters or you go snorkeling for them and you tickle them into a net. When you realize you go in and, and and it's not still water like a lake, it's rushing through because the tides are changing or whatever. And that power is just insane. So yeah. the final question I have for you is the same question that we ask everybody. It's the only question that we ask everybody. So if you were um, looking back at the things you've learned along this journey, Dave, what, what is the, the one thing that you would tell 10 year ago or 20 year old, 20 year ago, Dave, as he was setting out on this journey to change the world with voice over IP, what's the one thing you would tell that Dave to maybe think about differently or do differently or approach differently? 
Yeah, the thing that comes to mind immediately is I would tell that version of Dave, don't do it. <laughs> that was painful. <laughs> but, um, after uh, after he got after he said screw you and did it anyways, what would you yeah. tell him next? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's what I would have said to myself there too. Because I, I saw the vision and yeah. I it, it just captivated me. Like, wow, we could change the world doing this. Mm-hmm. And we could take on the giants. AT T, who cares? You know? <laughs> and uh and it, and it just really became super important to me. So I, I think the reality of it is I, I couldn't say no. It was one of those things where I just felt like I fit, like this would be something I wanted to do mm-hmm. and would end up doing well at it. And so, uh, so I would, I would say instead of don't do it, I, I think honestly I, I would do what I could do to encourage myself to take that risk. Well, I was going to say, Dave, it sounds like that really, I think that is the the lesson, right? Is it, you hit on something when people tell me they're thinking about starting a business or they want, I, I hear this, like, I want to be my own boss. I want to own my own business. And I see oftentimes doing what? And they're like, well, I'm not sure, you know? I, I, and I said, well, you better be damn sure. Like, and it better be something you're really good at or really, really, really passionate about um, because you you need to have a why. Like there better be something that's so important to you because you are going to at times probably forsake your family. You are going to spend lots and lots of time doing things that you never imagined you'd be doing. You will probably shed many a tear uh, when it isn't going right. You will want to quit over and over and over you will be confused and have nobody to turn to because everybody wants you to give them the next decision you'll feel like you have to solve all the problems instead of realizing you only need to do the next right thing and if you don't have that why or you're not really really passionate or really good at that thing that you're trying to pursue it's going to be miserable and and i you know my one thing i always remind myself and uh, just had this conversation again yesterday is when you, if you get outside of your domain expertise, you get outside of where your, your network lives, you get outside of, of those things, uh, you better tread lightly because you're probably going to get your ass kicked. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, being an entrepreneur means that you're in that lane. You're going to get your ass kicked. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it all rolls up to you, man. So that's uh, that has been some of the most difficult things for me. I, I think one of the seminal moments was when we were out of money, and uh, and I was trying to raise it from anybody I could, and everybody said no, and so I decided to to I couldn't sleep anyway. So it was four o'clock in the morning, and I came in here in this office, and just got down on my knees and said, Lord, why? Is this happening? Did you bring me out into the desert to <laughs> die? You know, and I was just so angry. And, and he said, um, no, you walked out there all on your own, Dave. <laughs> yeah. And so eight o'clock in the morning happens. I get a call from a guy who I talked about, who, who he and I had talked about him coming in and uh, giving me some money. And, uh, and he called me up and said, hey, you still need money? I said, yeah. And, and I wasn't going to make payroll that day. I thought this was going to be the end of Simple Signal. And he said, okay, yeah, I, I got 200000 that I can, I can loan you. So I said, wow, that's awesome. Thank you. And then I said, so uh, can I come over and, and pick up the check? And he <laughs> said, now I'm worried. <laughs> You need it that bad? <laughs> and I said, uh, yeah, I could really use it right now. And then I told him, I got a payroll to make, and I wasn't sure how this was going to happen. So he was cool about it. And uh, and from there, it just got so much better. But I, it took all of those emotions that you're talking about to, to just put on the table and be ready to let go of it. Yep. And, uh, and it just seems to work out. 
One of, but, one yeah, of my, every entrepreneur has these stories. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? It's, it's amazing. And one of my mm -hmm. one of my mentors who um, I, I just loved him to death, and Suzanne has heard me talk about him. And one of the greatest honors of my life was being able to to um, eulogize him. And uh, I mean, I guess it was a eulogy. I was more blubbering like a giant baby Huey, but uh, I was trying to get words out as uh, in between sobs because he he was so so great to me. But when I sat down, I met him as he was passing through town, um, and we sat down for lunch and. We sat there and he said, uh, he said, Mark, I'm, I'm all bruised up. And he made a gesture and, and, and I looked at him and he must have seen me looking at him like, what is this goofy old man talking about? And I said, you, I don't, I don't see any bruises on you, Harold. And he said, oh, no, no, no. On the inside. He said, I am, I'm just one giant bruise on the inside. I, I've been beat up my, you know, for years and years and years. And uh, I've got bruises all over, so you know, don't worry. And I was at about my lowest moment. It was it was tough. This was the 2000, 2009, early two thousand nine. Every the, the world had come to an end. The you know, financial crisis was killing it. And three of my largest customers had filed bankruptcy at, at, within ninety days. One of them was Nortel Networks. It hit me for six hundred and eighty seven thousand dollars worth of receivables that were stranded. And I didn't know how. I mean, I, I think at one point my our, our, our checkbook was minus four hundred and thirty five thousand. It was it was a disaster. And um, he went on to tell me that things were going to be okay. And he told me about a guy that he worked for who was a wildcatter. Um, he was a billionaire Texas oil man. And he said, Harold, you know, we need to go get somebody for this other business that, that they were running. And he said, we need to go get somebody. So what I want you to do is I want you to go out and find me a guy who had his own business and missed payroll. And Harold said, why would I get that guy, guy who missed payroll, a guy who can't make payroll. He's like, he's worthless. I, you know, I, I, why would I go get that guy to run one of our businesses? It's a, it's a $400 million business. He said, I want you to go get me a guy who's missed payroll once in his life because that man will never let that happen again. That lesson is etched on his soul. And he will never let that happen again. He, he will have learned from that and, and gotten humility like nobody ever gets humility because yeah. nobody ever wants to have that happen. And it, until you've been there, until you've hawked your car and, you know, put your house on the line and all that, that's when you really look down. When you have your moment where you're down on your knees in the office, you know, figuring out, you know, I think I've had that moment, although I don't think I was as as, as Find to God asking why he led me there. I think I was probably asking for the sweet release of death, but uh, <laughs> it seemed yeah. like a good option. That's not <laughs> but, but, um, you know, it, it, some, some moments it seems like that. But I think for, you know, for every, I, I was, uh, like a good story about redemption. I think for, I don't know anybody who's had tremendous success without those trials. I think it's very rare. That you that that success is a straight line, right? That's uh, yeah. that's what you're in for. So that's those yeah. are good stuff. So Dave, how can people? Uh, what are you doing today? How can they get in touch with you uh, if if uh, they're ever in need of advice or whatever? Yeah, I I do a little uh, executive coaching, and that's been a lot of fun to be part of watching a change in these CEOs. But uh, I can be reached at Dave at DaveGilbert.net. Simple little tag there. And uh, yeah. Cool. That would be great. Dave, thank you very much for your time. It's been, it's been great meeting you. And uh, like all our guests, every time I think uh, uh, that uh, uh, there's just always something to learn in everybody else's journey. Yeah, this is Absolutely. great. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on the show. Yeah, this is a, a little bit of uh, learning about on, how to be an entrepreneur and also like a counseling session. <laughs> yeah, it's a little cathartic for me too. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> well, thanks again, uh, Dave. Yeah, you need a counselor if you go into this line of work. <laughs> that's for yeah, sure, that's especially right. in tech. So. That's right. Absolutely. Good point, Mark. 
Well, for those of you listening, thank you so much. If you liked this episode, please rate it, like it, share it uh, with friends and family and colleagues. Uh, And stay tuned for the next episode. Until then, I'm Susanna Song. And I'm Mark Porter. And you're listening to The Working CEO. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe so you don't miss the next episode of The Working CEO. Also, don't forget to rate this show, share the episodes you like, and leave us a comment. Remember, whether your collar is blue or white, roll up your sleeves and get real. The Working CEO is made possible by Highwire Networks, a leading global provider of managed and professional services and managed cybersecurity services. We serve businesses in more than 180 countries. To learn more, visit highwirenetworks.com.